Hello. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Mamadou Djouf. I'm the director of the Institute of African Studies. And I would like to thank you for coming for this ev event we put together with SPAN, which is the SIPA uh, uh, African Network, the Association of African Students. And we are really happy to organize this event around Kenya, basically because uh, the role of the institute is to provide space for such discussion, is to provide space to African actors, to non-African actors intervening in Africa in order to provide, and this is really necessary, a better information about what is going on in Africa, but also to make sure that, you know, the, the knowledge which is being generated are taking into account not only the knowledge Africans are producing, but also their practices in trying to deal with their own conflicts. So today what we are going to do is precisely to provide more information and make sure that a conversation is going on about a crisis which is very important, which is defining in some cases not only the present but also the future of Africa, which is related, of course, to democratic processes. It's related to ways in which African actors, African masses are included or excluded in such processes. So again, thank you. Now I'm going to turn the floor to my colleague Jackie, who is going to actually chair this meeting. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Mamadou. I'm Jackie Klopp, and I'm a professor here at the School of International and Public Affairs. And it's really a privilege today to be the monitor, uh, mod monitor, yes, I'll be monitoring, <laughs> moderating this discussion uh, this evening, which is about Kenya and the way forward. I've been asked to say just a few words about the reason why we're here and also the spirit of the dialogue we hope to have today. As you know, Kenya, a very uh, important country in, certainly obviously for Kenyans, but for the East African region, the Great Lakes region as a whole, had a very disputed, contested presidential election, December 27th, 2007. Besides the contentious nature of this election, where the Electoral Commission of Kenya, the uh, body, the government body that was supposed to oversee the election um, had serious flaws. I'm sure Maina is going to talk about that in a little while. And very quickly, the incumbent Mwai Kibaki was uh, declared president, even though there were substantial allegations of fraud, manipulation, and deep problems with that commission. But these problems of the election aside, there was tremendous violence that occurred in the country that has left a thousand people, probably more dead, and hundreds of thousands of people displaced. The current figure is 290,000 people, adding to hundreds of thousands of people who had been displaced already in the 90s, creating an enormous humanitarian crisis, but also an enormous crisis in terms of Kenya's social, political, economic fabric, the ties that hold the country together, the, the personal ties that hold the country together. Um, there, I'm sure you've seen the news of the various kinds of killings from the police brutality in places like Kisumu where innocent people were shot dead by the police, and also the terrible targeted killings that have happened in places like the Rift Valley where large Entire villages and communities have been displaced and many people killed by uh, militias. Um, so this really constitutes a crisis and Kenya is at a turning point whether it moves 
really into something akin to civil war and therefore, in fact, contributes to the already extremely deep and grave problems of the entire Great Lakes region. Or, and this is what we're hoping desperately for and which we're hoping that many of you will play a role in, Kenya will move forward. Kenya will move forward to peace and that it will strengthen its fabric, its social fabric, um, and be an example of how to move away from the brink. And very much we decided that tonight would be in the spirit of moving forward, of not necessarily rehashing debates, even though it's incredibly important to understand what has happened. Some of that will become clear perhaps uh, after investigations that are ongoing, but that we need a strategy for moving forward and we hope the dialogue will move you in that direction. So, it is really my pleasure then to introduce the main panelists tonight and uh, their bios are available to you in detail so I'll be very brief. We are extremely delighted to have Maina Kiai here with us tonight. Uh, Maina is well known as a human rights activist, human rights lawyer. He is a person of tremendous, uh, that many, many Kenyans and those outside of the country respect deeply for his principled stances on so many issues. And he has been serving the Kenyan, uh, co the country of Kenya in the capacity of the head of the relatively newly formed National Human Rights Commission. And I have to say, Mina, you are really in the hot seat now. Um, they, will, they have been tasked with an investigation into this horrendous violence. Uh, Mina has gotten death threats, probably my guess is from multiple sides in this conflict. Um, but he has been consistently a voice for reason and principle in a context of tremendous turmoil, accusations, um, and, and hate speech. And so he really is playing a historical important, an important role in the conflict today, uh, in resolving this conflict um, today. It's also my pleasure to introduce a friend, a colleague, Muthoni Kamau, who I've known for a very long time. Muthoni is an unbelievably courageous human rights activist uh, like Maina. Muthoni, uh, pretty much wherever she goes, becomes an activist. Uh, she was at the University of Nairobi and was a founding member of the students' organization um, of the Ni uh, Nairobi University. She was, uh, when she left university, she had decided to forego many of the um, uh, further education opportunities and really worked in the trenches alongside Maina in the 90s. Uh, she worked with slum dwellers fighting land grabbing. She was way before people were talking about Mungiki, this Kikuyu sect gang. She was concerned about it, confronting Mungiki, talking to uh, youth uh, in the slums about this. She's really an incredible woman. She's now doing her master's at Cornell University. She has been back from Kenya recently, however, where she has been involved in peace initiatives at the grassroots in Central Province, convincing youth not to engage in revenge attacks, not to engage in violence. And I understand she did that very successfully in a number of cases, perhaps preventing more killings. She's also worked in the IDP camps, the internal displacement camps in Limuru, working with Luo, Kikuyu, Kisi, whoever's in these camps, uh, without caring for what affiliation, ethnic or otherwise, they might have. So uh, again, it's really a pleasure to have Muthoni with us. We are waiting for one of our panelists, but we're expecting her shortly. I'm just going to very briefly uh, introduce her. Her name is Ahuna uh, Asia Konwa. She, we're very proud of her. She's a SIPA alum. She's uh, high up in the Africa Bureau, in fact, the head of it, I believe, at UN OCHA, the Office for Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs. And so she has responsibilities linked to the enormous humanitarian crisis unfolding in Kenya today. We're hoping that she will talk to us about that. And last but not least, our very own Peter Rosenblum 
who uh, has again been an incredible human rights activist. He's worked all over the Great Lakes region. We're hoping uh, that he will give us some insight into what the implications of the Kenya crisis might be for the entire region. So it's my pleasure now to welcome Mina. Oh, and by the way, we're going to have one hour of sort of panel discussion, and then we we'll really want to have a dialogue. So welcome, Mina. Thank you very much, Jackie. And I can't, I must, I must say how happy I am to be here at Columbia. Um, I think probably this is, this is a, a step up for me. Um, in many ways, being at this school, uh, Peter and I go back a long way. And uh, the last time I think we met, we were at another school on, in the East Coast, some funny school in Cambridge, <laughs> Massachusetts. So it was not as good as Columbia. At any rate, uh, today, and I, I want to, I would like to make this as short as I can so that we can have real dialogue. And, we can, and I'd like to get some ideas from you all about how we should proceed and what we can do. Because I think sometimes when you're in the thick of things, you, you make certain assumptions, you use the knowledge you have and you think that you're moving forward, but sometimes you're just marking time. So it's good to have people who are, may have fresh, fresh looks at these things and clearly very smart people who are associated with Columbia University. So I would, I'd really welcome your comments, your input, your ideas into the crisis in Kenya. Now, clearly what we have in Kenya is a crisis. As, as Jackie says, it's a, it's a crisis. I don't think Kenya has ever gone through something similar to this. Probably the last time this happened was in the 1950s when Kenya, was, when Kenya began the armed struggle for independence against the British colonial rule. This is the really the only similar time that the country has been so shaken to its core when there are questions about whether Kenya will survive, whether we will die, whether we will collapse, or whether we will move forward. But the crisis also presents us with a unique opportunity, a wonderful opportunity which we need to grab. But we can only grab that opportunity if, we, if certain things happen. And so for us at this point, the Kofi Annan talks are it. If the Kofi Annan talks fail, we are finished. There's no other way of, and there's no other way to put it. It's done. I have traveled across the country in different parts, and I've been going around for a while. And I'm surprised sometimes when people say that they are shocked at what's happened in Kenya. I'm surprised when I talk to foreign missions here in Washington, in Europe, and other places, and they express shock that this happened. It was foreseeable. It was predictable. It was going to happen. All you needed to know, all you need to do is to talk to Kenyans to understand the depths of the resentment, the depths of the decay, and the wishes for change and the wishes to move forward that had been there. For 20 years, Kenyans have been dealing with constitutional reform, not because we understand what constitutions are, but because we understood that the fabric of the nation had ended. What, was, what we had as Kenya was still the colonial state in every form. And that, that colonial state, just like, just like it, it gave up in the, when the British were ruling, was collapsing, was, edify, was, was, was decaying. It was imploding. And therefore, we needed to change the framework of the way we dealt with each other, the way government dealt with us. So for the last 20 years plus, people have been agitating, working on, moving, debating, pushing, educating, creating awareness around the idea of a new constitution so that we can reestablish and reconstitute the Kenyan state. So we can begin readjusting the relationships between Kenyans and their government. We can begin adjusting and, 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 and relating again as different communities, trying to carve a nation out of disparate communities. And we'd gone far, we'd gone very far. In 1997, uh, we were on the streets every Saturday, starting March 30th, I think Modoni was there in those days. Every Saturday, we were on the streets demonstrating for constitutional reform. And I remember people who were then in government under the Arab Moy coming to us and saying, you know, can people eat constitution? What is this constitution issue you're, you're raising? And this was civil society generally bringing in politicians, trying to bring in the religious organizations 
and moving. And we began off as a small group of 50, 60 people. And every Saturday, it grew bigger, it grew bigger, it grew bigger. By July 7th, the crowd was 3,000, 4,000 people in Nairobi. And then the government made a big mistake. They killed some people then. And by August, we were 5,000, 10,000 on the streets. And the government was paralyzed. And then our own inadequacies happened. We were naive in certain ways as a civil society. And we had a break between the civil society and the political class. P political class went off with the constitutional reform agenda. They marginalized the civil society. And then a whole new process began that was going, looking like it might lead to a new constitution. All that, and I don't need to go into that history. Uh, you can always read it up in the internet and other places. Is to say that it has been clear to us as Kenyans that we needed political, structural reforms. Mwai Kibaki was elected in 2002 on the basis of political reforms, of changing the way government dealt with each other. The coalition he was part of was, was very clear about power sharing, to have inclusive government as opposed to winner-take-all, zero-sum game, fast past the post approach. And the first thing he did when he got to power was discard that agreement, the first thing. And from then on, we are back again to where we were in the 90s, essentially, except from Mwai Kibaki as opposed to Daniel Rap Moy, is that, Moy, is that Kibaki focused a lot on economic growth, thinking that if he, pro if he provides economic growth and economic development, the political reform issues will subside. But that's not the case. And in fact, there was, a, there was a analysis and scenarios building in the year 2000, where exactly the scenario that has happened to us was presented. That if we did purely economic reforms, economic growth, economic development, without concomitant political reforms, crisis would happen and would get into a war. And I would urge you to visit the site www.kenyanscenarios.org. You'll see it. And this was 2000. So there's nothing here that is, that is, for us, new. It was expected. Now, the major issue people, many people are focusing on when they look at Kenya is the violence. And, and that is correct. And we should look at that violence and be worried by it. In the one month since the election results were announced, we have had at least 1,000 people dead. And we've had 250, 300,000 people internally displaced within the country. In between 1992 and 1998, in the politically instigated violence that affected Kenya, run by Moy, planned by Moy, we had 3,000 people dead in that six year period and 250,000 people internally displaced over six years. So the figures we have for one year, for one month, are very close to what happened over six years. This tells you that if we don't deal with these questions, these fundamental underlying issues, the next time violence explodes, and it will explode if we don't deal with it, it will be way more than 5,000, way more than 10,000. And as the longer this crisis draws out, the longer we're not able to reach progressive movement forward that's acceptable to all of us as Kenyans, the harder it will be to resolve that violence. So the time to resolve is now. And let me also say that in that violence that's going on, every side is involved. Every single side. There are no angels, and, are, and everybody is a victim. There has been a, a consistent attempt by both sides to, to try and be the victim alone. If you talk to people in the ODM, what they say mostly is look at the killings in Kisumu. Look at the killings in Kakamega and Migori, where police shot at people. And it is true police shot. And at least, I would say, easily 100 plus people were killed in Kisumu, Kakamega, Migori, and Kibera in Nairobi. Shot by the police in cold blood, not trying to, to stop a riot or stop. Uh, people were shot in the back. I have seen the autopsies. I've seen the bodies. I've seen the hospital reports. People were shot in the back as they were running away by the police. That amounts to a very serious atrocity that somebody must be held accountable. And not just the police themselves, including the political controllers. And when you talk to the PNU, the government side, they point to you Eldoret in the Rift Valley. And clearly there as well, there's been a massive atrocities. People's houses burnt, churches burnt. 
a church burnt, which we all saw. Kids killed. Again, that leads to some of the 1,000 people who have been killed. These are done by militia. And these militia have their roots, by the way, in that violence of 1990s. Be during those clashes, Moy's strategy was, was to use militias that were going around killing people, displacing them, burning their houses. And because we did not do anything about that, even though we were promised and we were sure that we would do, that we would do a truth, justice, and reconciliation commission, Kibaki said he won't do it. He said that it's it's uh, it's uh, we are we are waking we are waking up old old dogs. We are you know what is it? What's the English saying? Uh, let sleeping dogs lie or something like that. And that uh, we're opening up old wounds. And I had conversations after conversations with many many people in government saying. If we don't deal with this thing, and I know truth commissions are painful and they are hard, but if we don't deal with it, it will rise up and hurt us even more to be more painful than not. Then it's be more painful to it's it's painful to deal with it, but it's it's much more painful not to deal with it because it will come back again, and that's exactly what happened. So these militias were easy to remobilize, easy to put them together, easy. They knew the targets, they knew the communities were there, and this is what happened. So you hear the PNU saying, oh, that is genocide. Oh, we were the victims. That's not alone. And that's true. They were victims of Kikuyus in Eldoret that people must be held accountable to. Somebody must be held accountable. And when we have gone visiting there, where I was, I was heckled and booed by, by some of the IDPs themselves because they called me a traitor. Because I happen, Mwai Kibaki and I come from the same village. And there's a sense in many parts of, of Kenya that if you come from the same village as the president, you're, you must support him unreservedly and psychophantically. I said I have a job to do. And I must look at every side. And I got heckled I'm in, a, in a crowd by about 5,000 people. And let me tell you guys, heck, being heckled is not funny. Eh? It's not funny. It's not funny. But it happened and you actually do have a sense of fear. There's a lot of anger and a lot of fear within a society. But that's not genocide as far as we are concerned, as far as we, are, we, as far as we see. Because when you look at the definitions of genocide and you look at the practice of genocide, and there's all these conventions and Peter can run through them for us later. But one of the things that always has happened in, in declaring a genocide is that there's either state complicity or state collapse. So if the government wants to call Eldoret genocide, then it either tells us, it, it's telling us that either it was complicit or it has collapsed as a state. And I think that's a big statement to make. But again, it's part of this whole victimology that both sides are seeking to have. And the third form of violence which we have been talking about is the violence by the government-supported militia, the Mungiki, that is mostly in Nairobi and now in Nakuru and Naivasha, and also committing serious atrocities against people, against the Luo, the Luya, the Kalenjin, killing them, burning their houses, chasing them out of their homes. And there are quite a few of them in those areas. And again for this, somebody must be held accountable. And we're tracing where these, like, where, where, where the linkages and the lines of accountability go to. And you will be surprised by some of the names that are coming up. We don't have concrete evidence yet. We have a lot of names, a lot of stories told to us. But we're going to gather that evidence. We will get it. Because it just takes one or two people to sing. And they will sing. And we'll know who they are. But it's people pretty high up in the, in the, in the, in the, within the government structure behind Mongiki. And some pretty high up people within ODM behind the killings in Eldoret. Our view is consistent. We must have accountability on all those three sides. Somebody must be held accountable. Kenya cannot move as it has done for 44 years without accountability. And part of the lack of, of part of the reason, part of the impact of this impunity is the rampant corruption you find in the society. The rampant insecurity that you have in, in society. Because as long as you're important, as long as you've got access to powerful people, then you must. Then you can get away with almost anything. Almost anything. Now we are saying very clearly though that all this violence as we, as we put it out is a political crisis with ethnic expression. Let's make this clear. It's a political crisis with ethnic expression. Very often in Africa, commentators, especially from the West, look at Africans fighting and in conflict and say, ah, ethnic 
cleansing, tribal warfare. And I wish they would say that about other countries as well, but they only say, seem to say that for, for Africa alone. It is political crisis with ethnic expression. And we say that because the trigger has, is political. The violence that started in 1990s was political. But because we organize our politics ethnically, then it, needs, then it, it goes to say for sure that the expression of that conflict has to be ethnic. But it's not that Kalenjins wake up one day and say, we don't like Ikuyus, let's go and kill them. In fact, I suggest, and we have argued often, that part of the reason the violence has spread so rapidly and was so surprising to many people was because of the, of the collapse of peaceful forms of resolution of our conflicts and differences. Yes, there are cleavages, yes, there are differences. But if you don't have peaceful ways of dealing with them, then oftentimes human beings resort to violence. And that's where some of it is coming from. Not all of it, some of it. And part of that is the vote. And, part of, and a lot of that is the vote. Because, again, one of the differences between many African countries and Kenya is that the year 2002 marked a huge step forward for us. The people of Kenya finally routed out an intransigent, demonic, uh, base system called Kanu that had been ruling us for 40 years plus. And that was a huge move for us to make. You cannot imagine the kind of mental empowerment that it gave Kenyans. We've beat Moy and his, ins and his structures and beat him properly. I mean, Uhuru Kenyatta got about 30% of the vote towards, and Kibaki got almost 65%. It was a massive hammering of Kanu, a demolition of it. And that gave Kenyans a real sense of empowerment. And then that coupled up with the referendum of, of November 2005, where government on, the, on a new constitution, where government had proposed a constitution that, that was, I think, more defeated because of the process rather than substance. We didn't have time to discuss the substance. But that process was political entirely. But, and it, it again, government was beaten. So people felt, hey, we can, we can show, we can do what we can resolve our differences. We can show government through our vote. But the whole process then of this election was such that we lost confidence in the vote. And we've lost it now. And to gather that up again, I'm, you know, sometimes I look at the news uh, in, in Nairobi and I worry because they're talking about by-elections for some of these members of parliament who have died. And I can tell you, the electoral commission as it exists cannot, cannot handle and organize an election that people will buy. It is discredited. It needs to be disbanded. It just needs to go home. And those who have been involved in the, in the stealing and the mess up that, we, that happened in, this, in December 2007 needs to be held accountable for it. It was a deliberate plan. And, you, and, you, and I've got, if you get a chance, you can look at, at the testimony I gave in Congress uh, last week where I outlined some of the, some of the signs that show that it, it was a deliberate process to get a predetermined result in that election. So that is a major step for us. And, and also, I must also say that one of the things that Kenyans are different is that there's been more than 15 years of civic education, grassroots education, grassroots empowerment. So people have been getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And since 1992, a culture of openness and challenge and talking and, and, and challenging power has arisen. So it's, it's, we are now at the stage where we are no longer where we were in the 90s, where we feared power. We can now challenge power. We can speak truth to power. And all these dynamics then tell us that Kenya is a very different society. So when you try and affect the vote in front of us, and you know the difference between this, this theft of 2007 and previous Moi thefts of 92 and 97, is that at least Moi used to steal the election at night. And we'd wake up and we've told, there's a result, Daniel Moi is the winner. And we say, okay, it's fine. You know, we, we complain and say, we, I can't be sure, he can't have, couldn't have won. But it's done at night and it was very, very well done. This election was stolen in front of our eyes on live television. We could see it. Issues are raised on the floor of, of the counting room. And people are saying, look, Mr. Chairman, it was announced in Molo that there were 50,000 votes. And you're announcing 75,000 votes for Kibaki here. Can you explain? And he's not explaining. They were not explaining. 
and it's been, it was consistent. There were many more of those, many more of those. And because the electoral commission was unable to tell us why it's become 75 and not 50,000. And maybe 75,000 was right. Maybe it was right. But we don't know. Because we saw it, the questions being asked, no answer. Where Maragua in central Kenya has a vote turnout of 115% and it's raised. How do you get 115% turnout? And then it's changed to 85% later. How? No one knows how it was changed. No one knows how, who was cut down to make it 85%. And when Nivi comes and announces 95% and Juja 100,000 votes for Mwai Kibaki, it just sounded so wrong. Say, hey, tell us how these figures are changing. And that's the simple question we're asking the Electoral Commission. Tell us, because we're seeing this live. And the SMS is now going around. People who had agents there sending back information. So it's much harder to steal in that form. And so when you steal in this new technological age of live television and SMSs, you have to steal smartly. You have to steal smartly. You can't keep doing it. You can't do the same way Moi did. You simply can't. And let me tell you, Moi did steal. I looked at some of the figures going back to the 1997 elections. And in Moi's district of Baringo, there was only two polling stations that didn't have a 200% plus turnout. Only two. Everywhere else had more than 200% turnout. And Odaya, by the way, in 1997, where Mwai Kibaki and I come from, there were two polling stations that had well over 100% turnout. So this has been consistent in terms of pumping up the votes and doing it. But the difference this time in the stealing was in the counting hall, in the tallying place, where votes were just being, numbers were just being changed and put through. So this is some of the things that led to a lot of rage and anger that you see. And, this is, and so all the underlying issues of resentment, of, of anger, of, uh, of non-sharing, of resources, of corruption, all these things come together and say, we are fed up. We have to change this system. We have to change it. And that's why we have been brought in this country today. We are at the point where we have to change the system. The winner-take-all system cannot continue. And I happened to call um, Samuel Kivuitu, the chairman of the Electoral Commission, I called him more than five times that, that day that the election was also being announced. And I kept begging him, saying, look, we have seen what we have seen. Don't announce anything. And I said to him, don't even announce Raila Odinga, even if it's Raila Odinga. The country cannot take it. You have to show us that what, you, what is being announced is true. Don't announce, take a week. Take us through a process. Every day we are seeing the ballots. Do a recount for crying out loud. You can do it. And he said no. He went ahead and announced. And I told him, you know, it will blow. I can feel it. I can see it. It will blow. And he went ahead and announced. So part of it is just that whole process of, of seeing it. And, and a number of other things also had. The law, the election, the election law in Kenya provides that if there is contestation of an election result, after it's declared, the contestant, the, the contester has 24 hours to make a written complaint, and the Electoral Commission has 48 hours to respond. Well, in this case, Samuel Kivuitu declared Moi Kibaki the, pres the winner at 5.30, and at 6.15, Kibaki had been sworn in. Quick. No chance to make a written complaint complaint. And then they tell us, go to court. There's no way. I mean, so the whole idea was that Kibaki had pumped in people into the Electoral Commission. In fact, at some point we were calling it the Electoral Commission of Kibaki, ECK. And now you're telling us to go to the High Court of Kibaki, where every judge is appointed by Kibaki. So it's no longer High Court of Kenya, it's called the High Court of Kibaki. What, do you, what result do you expect out there? And I remember having debates with some friends of mine who are avidly pro-Kibaki in this and saying, look, in Florida, when there was a dispute, they went to court. And I said, How, what did the court rule? You know? <laughs> what did the court rule? Precisely my point, you know. The court, the Supreme Court was favored and it ruled exactly how it's supposed to have ruled. And the difference, of course, with Florida is that the election result was not announced until after the decision of the court, which makes a hell of a difference. So these are the problems that are there. What's the way forward? Clearly, as I said, serious fundamental restructuring of the state must happen. This is the time to reconstitute the state. And, I'm, and maybe it's 
it's, it's uh, you know, I, uh, in a sense, it is our civil war moment that the Americans had in 1861. But I hope we don't have to go through civil war to get to where you got. We don't need it. We, ha we can avoid the mistakes you made. We can learn from the mistakes you made and not get there. But we're at a critical point where we can go forward or we can go backward. And it's about the nature of the state. That's just like it was in 1861. What's the nature of the American state? And that's where we are. So we have got to reconstitute that state. And we've got to move that state in a manner that makes sense for all of us. We cannot live in the old British style winner take all situation that you all have in this country. And I pity you for that system. It's a dangerous system. And particularly for us who come from divided, poor societies, the winner take all system means that if you're not the winner, it can mean death. If you're not the winner, you don't get development. If you're not the winner, you don't get roads. If you're not the winner, you don't get schools. You don't get education. Winning means a lot. So being the winner is a matter of life and death. It is very, very high stakes. It's extremely high stakes. So we've got to lower those stakes so that we don't really matter if we have a George Bush type head of state for a few years. We can live, we can plod along with that kind of person. But we can't in Kenya. We have a George Bush type, and we saw it with Daniel Moy, where Kenya was probably the, probably the only country I know in the world that has not had a military coup or civil conflict whose economy was kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. It's unbelievable in Moy's time. And we just can't afford to have that again. I think Kenyans are tired of that, of thinking they can go back to that system where somebody wakes up and decides that you are, whether, whether you're a human being or not a human being in one day. So for me, it doesn't matter who becomes president. It's a matter of reconstituting that state. It's a chance for us to reform the police force. Again, our police force was formed, I think, in 1902 for, by, by the British and retains exactly the same standing orders and, and, and code of conduct that they had in the colonial period. So much so, that and I was, one of them, I was, I, was, I was reading one some time ago, that it is that a police officer, even off-duty, can, you know, our police officers live in the, in the police station area, in the camps. They're not like Americans living in homes. Uh, they live in these camps. Uh, for a police officer off duty to take 14 paces away from the police station, he must get permission from his superior officer. Absolutely incredible codes of conduct they have there. But, and again, our police force was formed with the purpose of oppressing and controlling the majority African population for the benefit of the settler class. And that's exactly what it does now, today, up to today. Except the settler class is no longer British and white. The settler class is black, small, minority, and extremely rich. But they perform exactly the same functions as the settler class. So what we did, in a sense, in 1963, and which we have not moved from, was that we got independence without freedom. We got the flag without our freedom. And freedoms have been slowly coming through in Kenya since, particularly since 1992. But we've come to a point where the constitution has finally seen its last. It cannot take us forward. It cannot. And I, I get amused sometimes looking at some of the debates, people saying, well, these ideas coming in for transitional government, interim governments, they're not constitutional. Well, the const we don't, we're not there to serve the constitution. The constitution is there to serve us. And this constitution has expired, expired date. We're now, you know, the sell-by date of it has gone. It's time for us to be creative, time for us to think out of the box and think how can we hold this country together if we want to hold it together. Because that's a decision, again, we have to think about. Do we want Kenya to exist as it does? And I think we have got to understand as well how we can create a nation out of the disparate communities that exist. Because, again, since 1963, there has been no serious conscious attempt to create a nation out of Kenya. And nations are consciously created. They don't happen by chance. And somehow, Jomo Kenyatta, Daniel Moy, Mwai Kibaki thought that it will happen anyway. A nation will come. It doesn't happen just like that. And when you look at st the history of a country like this one, you see conscious efforts to have a common history that you can all 
come to, whether it's the Mayflower coming across, the war, the, the war for independence, the civil rights movement, the, the anti-slavery uh, the, the movements. There's all these conscious efforts to create a history that you can all share together. And the same is true for many nations across the world. And Tanzania has done that. South Africa is doing it. We have never done it. We don't have a common history. We have our own ethnic history, and each Kenyan can tell you what their he ethnic heritage is and who was the God and how that ethnic community came into being. They can barely tell you about other communities or about what each community has done to come together and to, and to contribute to what Kenya is. So one of the things we have been trying to push for the last two or three years is to push a, a, histori a, hist a, historical, um, a historical project to look at the resistance of and the resistance to British colonial rule and the fight for independence of all the Kenyan societies. And the more I have learned that, the more impressed I have been that every single community in Kenya had a role to play coming up to independence. From the white community, where there's a living legend, John Nottingham, a Kenyan man, white man, who played a tremendous role. The Indian population, Mark and Singh, Pilgama Pinto, who played a role to make Kenya what it is. The Somali community, the Kisi community, the Nandis, the Kikuyu, the Luo, every, the Kambas, Mwindi Mbingu, every single community in the country contributed to making Kenya independent at some point. But you don't hear about them. Instead, we hear about Jomo Kenyatta and the, and the Mau Mau, essentially. Sometimes we hear about, a little bit, about, uh, about Jaramogi Ginga Odinga. And then, since Moy became president, you hear about Moy fighting for independence. Although, historically, I'll tell you, he was supporting the colonial government. <laughs> but this is historical revision, that the revisionism that they put in. But that's the, that's the fate. We talk about personalities, a few who are important. So we have no history that we can all tie, to, tie us together. And that's something we need to do. We will need to do for us to move forward. So the way forward, again, is really the reconstitution of the state. And, I, and there are many things that, that fall there. I don't need to go through them. I think I'll bore you if I went through each of them that we're thinking about. And, and who knows whether we'll have a chance to move there. We are also trying now to get a sense of entering this dialogue. We accept that this next few days are critical for Kenya. And the talks as they happen between today, Friday, Saturday, are, 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 are pivotal for us. If there's a sense of pro progress and agreement between these two sides by Friday, Saturday, I think you'll see movement towards a new Kenya. If we don't see that, if we don't see that, then I think we can expect serious trouble from next week, even if it's only for a short time. Serious trouble. So we are at that point now where we need to make progress. And so it is very disturbing when, when, I, when, I, when you go onto the news today in Kenya and you find out that 40 MPs from the government side, from PNU, are saying they don't want an interim transitional government. That what they want is for Raila Odinga and ODM, that their compromise in this negotiation is for Raila Odinga and ODM to form official opposition. And you think, is that movement forward? This is exactly what they've been saying from the beginning. Talks and negotiations means giving and taking. You just can't have the same position with different words. And if that, and there has to be movement, it is, cannot be business as usual. And that position of saying, we want you to be for official opposition is business as usual. It has to change. They have to give in some. And this is the responsibility then of Mwai Kibaki as the leader of PNU to make that step to say that he loves the country and he cares about Kenya more than he loves himself. He has a definitive role to play in the future of Kenya because there's a lot of fear among the Kikuyu population about what could happen to the Kikuyus without Mwai Kibaki. And that fear needs to be recognized. It's an important one. But he also needs to recognize that he cannot run the country the way Kenyatta ran it, the way Moi ran it, and the way he ran it the last five years. And neither can Raila Odinga run that country the same way it's been run before. Nobody can. The country has changed. And so one of the things we keep pushing is that we're not looking just for a win-win situation. We're looking for a win-win-win situation where the third win is the people of Kenya. 
Because that third win is where, which has always been ignored. But the people of Kenya have reclaimed lots of ground through this process and through processes from before. And that's, that ground must not be ceded. In fact, it needs to be enhanced and moved forward. That's where, that's how the country can move forward. Otherwise, you, if we don't do that, many you might have to see a lot of us coming here as refugees and looking for, for classes, in your class, sharing classes with you at Columbia if we don't solve this, the, the problem here. And sometimes I'm optimistic, sometimes I get, I get low. But I think this, this choice of Kofi Annan was the best choice we could have done. It was the best choice. He carries with him a lot of, a lot of stature and a lot of credibility. And I think it's great that he's there. He needs to be there for the long haul. This won't end this week. It won't end this month. But the first step must be taken this week. And you need to see something as well, the violence. And one of the reasons I say this is, this is, not, just eth this is not ethnic violence. It's political violence. And that you can trace this violence with the political movements forward. Whenever, they looks, whenever the talks look like they are moving forward, you start seeing a lull in the violence. When you see the talks are not going anywhere, it rises. I remember early on when Bishop Tutu came to Kenya to visit with the, with the support of the Catholic, with the support of the, the Africa, all African Council of Churches. So he came to Nairobi. He says, I'm here. I want to see Kibaki. And Kibaki said, I won't see you. And then started looking stupid. But when Kibaki met Tutu, you saw a lull in the violence. And then when Kibaki went and announced his cabinet, you saw an increase in the violence. So yes, there's some form of violence that's, go that's going on that is out of control, that is criminal, that's out there. But I think that's not so hard to deal with as it is harder to deal with the other one. So this issue for us now is, is, is got to be a blunt. We as Kenyans have to be blunt about our country. And we've got to think bigger than who we are. We've got to think bigger than our ethnic communities. And we've got to think bigger than what we think we can get out of these processes. This is our chance. And we can do it right or we can do it wrong. But we have to be bigger than what we are seeing so far. And we have to be bigger than our communities. And I, and I have no apologies to make for the positions I have taken. Whether I am from Udaya or from Langata or from Bondo. I have no apologies to make. I would love to see, in fact, somebody from Bondo, from Raila's home, taking similar positions as I do, right in the middle. I would like to see that. And I can see more and more Kenyans saying, leave these hardliners on the Kibaki side and leave the hardliners on the, on the Raila side. Where is the common ground that accepts we have to have both of them in this rather than just one? You go to Kisumu today, they keep saying, for them, what they're expecting from the talks is simply one thing, that Raila Odinga will, will claim what was his, what, what he won on December 27th, the presidency. I think that's impossible. I think it's impossible. So we've got hardliners on every side. And our job, and for you all who are here, Americans, Kenyans, Africans, your, what you can do is keep this issue on the agenda. Whatever you can, talk about it, talk with Kenyans, talk among yourselves in schools, write to your Congress people. And I must say, I don't know, there no, there's nobody here, maybe some, anybody from uh, Minnesota out here. Excellent. The Minnesota people are great. There's a huge diaspora of Kenyans and Somalis in, in, in Minneapolis. They have done fabulous work lobbying their Congress with the Senator Coleman. That Co Senator Coleman has become one of the leading players in the Senate on Kenya because of the Somalis. Excellent. Because of the Somalis. There has been such movement on. So whatever you can do, think creatively, think out of the box. If you have any linkages, to people in Kenya, some of the major players. We are pushing very strongly for continued travel bans. And travel bans not only on those people who are poly political players, but also the business community, the older business community that's supporting the militias on both sides. And we want to see them, I want to see the travel bans on them. Those business community who are supporting the militia and who happen to be landlords to the US Embassy in Nairobi, we want them banned, we want the assets frozen. We can't have the United States government linking up with these guys because they are linking up. And there are many small things, but we have learned over the process that what seems to get these elite 
on both sides, what, give, what keeps them at the table, what keeps them honest, is not the number of debts, it's not issues of sanctions and cutting aid, it's personal issues. They care about visiting America and London and, and Paris. Yeah? They love that. Stop them from going there. When they are, and, and the other place you have to stop is South Africa. They have to stop South Africa because it's become a new place for them to go. And their monies are actually in Switzerland, in Liechtenstein, in London, here in New York City. Freeze that money. These guys will come running to the table. You will be surprised. These guys are purely selfish. That's their first thing. It's all about themselves. They sit at the table when they are personally affected. When their kids can't come to the States to study, their kids cannot go to the UK to study, then they take it seriously. But if it's other people dying, ah, let them just. The poor people dying, let them die. You have a callous group of political elite. A very callous group. And they, we have to hit them where it hurts. Them, their families, and their wallets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina, for that extremely eloquent uh, speech and a very illuminating one. Uh, I'm now going to ask Muthoni Kamal to make some comments. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and thank you, Mina, for the eloquent uh, input to this discussion. Uh, Mina speaks from the top. I will speak from the bottom. And um, I just want to say that Kenya is our boat. Some people have started drilling holes and we are on high seas. We need to start first to stop drilling, then ask ourselves how we stop the water from getting onto the boat. Otherwise, we are going to sink. I don't come from Central, even though I'm a Kikuyu. I was born and brought up in the Rift Valley and I know how it feels to be displaced because I was displaced. Um, but I wasn't as hopeful as some people were when Mwai Kibaki got to power in 2002. I celebrated, of course, having been jailed and beaten and all sorts of things by the Moi government. I celebrated his exit, but I also knew and I kept telling those who are celebrating that the war is not over, we are just starting and I've been vindicated because these are the same people who took power in 1963 and the people they have groomed over the years and it's just been a game of musical chairs. So it is a terrible thing, we feel like we are between a rock and a hard place. As Maina says, we've fought many battles. We have pushed for a change of the constitution. These two protagonists, <coughs> I would say, have frustrated our move to push for a clear constitutional review in the country. I remember when we were almost getting Moi to accept that in 1999, Raila Odinga himself defected with his party and joined Moi. And uh, within Kanu, he started saying that parliament can rewrite the constitution for the whole country. And the rest of us were saying no, because the political class have their own vested interests and they are not going to change that constitution to, to, to favor the majority of the Kenyans, the peasant farmers, the slum dwellers, the people who need land to till, uh, places to live, they were not going to do that. And so we formed you know, the civil society, religious uh, movement, and uh, the opposition at that time, Kibaki was the official leader of the opposition. We formed our own initiative, pushing that parliament cannot rewrite, rewrite the constitution on behalf of the whole country. After all, parliament is one creation of the same constitution. Unfortunately, the second person to betray that movement 
was Kibaki himself. When a few months after we started nego the negotiations, I was uh, selected to be in the negotiating team of the, of the, what we were calling it the Ufunga Mano Initiative that was saying the whole country must be engaged in rewriting the constitution. A few months after, Kibaki himself defected and gave in and there was declared a merger of the two sides. Eventually what happened is that the bombers was minus the peasants, was minus the slum dwellers, was minus the uh, internally displaced people of Kenya, was minus the critical mass where most of the women are and even though in the end they couldn't even agree to adopt that Bombers of Kenya uh, uh, project, still it was not the best, but it could have been um, better than what we have uh, currently. But I wanted to say that we are between a rock and a hard place. If you look at the mega corruption deals, you find people who participated in Goldenberg, for example, in the PNU, in the, the Kibaki side, and under ODM. And so while we criticize all this, we must know that at the end of the day, these two sides uh, belong to the same side. Soon they are going to find some accommodation of each other. But the losers are the majority Kenyans who have been pitted against each other and can't rely on each other now just because you come from a different uh, ethnic community. Now, um, I have titled my short input, Peace Building bottom up. And I'm arguing that even though we are hoping that the two protagonists at the top are going to find some solution for the current uh, uh, situation, it should not be taken for granted that families and communities that have lived together in the slums, in the rural areas, but now are fighting amongst themselves will start hugging each other and, you know, embrace each other. There are deep-seated um, wounds that have been inflicted and they need to be healed for people to start looking at each other as good neighbors uh, and to be able to accommodate uh, each other. There is need, therefore, to recognize, foster and support small, medium, and any initiative seeking to help affected people come to terms with the situation and process their feelings. Action, actions to stop revenge should be the first step. Because when violence starts, it begets more violence. When people are attacked, they feel vulnerable. In the first place, when the Kikuyus are attack, were attacked in the Rift Valley, the same government that is making them get uh, attacked did not come to defend them. And so what they did was to revenge. It doesn't help because they will revenge and then the attackers will attack more. And the cycle starts like that. I think initiatives that are on the ground trying to cut that cycle should first and foremost be supported. And then, you know, we can start seeing some movement towards uh, reconciliation. The attackers need to be demobilized. People have to take, you know, great risk. Being a Kikuyu, I can approach Kikuyu youth, but of course at great risk to myself because you soon become a traitor. But if we want to save our country, we have to do that. So we have to move in, dissuade them from doing what they are doing, you know, reasoning with them that when a Kikuyu is killed on the other side of the country and you kill a Luo on this side, it doesn't help, you know? And it will not, you know, make you uh, get out of the underdevelopment that, you know, we are facing right now. So we need to work more towards such uh, activities. And I have noted a few activities and groups that have uh, tried to do that. The Mwamuko, Mwamuko uh, Peace and Reconciliation Initiative for Kenya uh, found this approach very useful in the face of great risk of trying to say you're reconciling two warring groups. But it is useful to first talk to one side away from the other. And even though we could only reach 
um, you know, only the, the, the Kikuyus, for example, but it was helpful. We managed to make some of them stop engaging in the acts of retaliating and, you know, killing their neighbors that, they, you know, um, they were planning to, to attack. And of course, we saved some lives. And there are many such small activities happening, which needs to be recognized, which needs to be amplified and multiplied. Because whether the, the top people greet each other and they find, accommodate each other, we still need to heal and we still need to move forward. Although the only team, uh, uh, the team that we were working with, although only um, say like if we have Kikuyus amongst ourselves, we could send them to the Kikuyu uh, community to do the work, but we found at the end of the day when we, we gather all these efforts, then we have been able to reach a bigger and wider um, um, range of people and it helps us now to be able to deal with the humanitarian crisis uh, after that. If such efforts were replicated, then we would start seeing uh, fruits uh, from the bottom. The women of Kenya have suffered more from this violence. They are the fewest in this, you know, at the top where political power is being um, um, fought for. But aside from that, they suffer the most. Apart from losing uh, life and limb, they, they, they also lose their property. They lose their children. Their sons die in these useless battles. Their husbands. And one important thing to note is that women and girls are more targeted during this violence because they are more vulnerable. We have had a very high increase of rapes. They are raped by the attackers, you know, as a way of attacking the, the other community. But also we have information that within the camps, they are also taken advantage of and they are raped by their fellow men in the camps themselves. When this, you know, violence takes um, effect and there are gangs ruling the, 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 the roads and the streets, the women have no way of moving around because they fear um, not only being attacked physically, but also rape, which is even more um, dehumanizing. Yet, these women, against all odds, are also our hope because in some of the camps that we visited, we find that although there are IDPs, internally displaced people, who come from different communities, the women don't look at each other as from different communities. They are feeding their children together, they are taking care of the children together, and we saw great love, motherly love that can be harnessed and can help us rebuild what has, has been lost. So I'm arguing that efforts should be made towards mobilizing women to give them a profile, to give them some training so that they can first help in demobilizing their sons, their husbands, their brothers. Then they can move to the point of uh, building peace structures within their own communities. And then they can start reconciling the two sides that are fighting or the three sides that are fighting. Women have a way of accepting, you know, they don't feel shameful to accept, okay, we are beaten, unlike the men, because traditionally, you, you, you know, the men has to, to show courage and that kind of thing. So they engage in the first place, they are so easy to engage in that kind of violence. But on the other hand, they're also very difficult to um, compromise. But women will say, hey, we don't have food for the children, and the children are asking for food, you know, we are suffering, we can't even bury our dead in peace. We are the ones who are getting raped. And they will start listening to each other. And if we harness that, maybe we'll be able um, to find a solution um, whether this violence is going to, you know, whether the, the political protagonists are going to agree or disagree, we still need to save lives. And women can play a big role um, in that.
It is important though um, to be able to recognize that there are so many hardships on the ground. There are so many hardships. Um, while we talk about involving women, these are people who in the first place have been displaced. They don't have homes. Many of them don't know where their children are. Many of them are nursing uh, sick relatives they ran away with. HIV, you know, has been a problem. All these burdens are on them. All these burdens are on them. They're also frustrated uh, politically. And one important thing uh, we can do is try and, you know, um, organize a way of giving them the capacity, despite all that, to be able to engage in the peace building uh, mechanisms that they have already uh, started. So, you know, I, I, I have many things I would like to say, but I was asked to talk about the gender aspect of this. It is a fact that uh, there are so many women affected, women and children, and uh, you know, even as we uh, register the internally displaced, they are very, the statistics are not reflecting how many women are in the camps. They are not reflecting how many women have been raped. Some of them are not even coming forward to report this because they have been warned by the rapists. You know, we are not, you, we, we are not um, putting a gender aspect into analyzing this problem. And so we need uh, to do that and to be able to appreciate the, the, the the immense suffering that the women of Kenya are going through, and also to be able to accept the fact that still we can harness a lot of peace building through the nurturing aspect of the woman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muthoni, for a really compelling uh, talk and also for really articulating a vantage point that I think is uh, disturbingly missing from a lot of the discussion so far. Um, I'm going to ask the next panelist um, to be a, a, a little briefer, um, just out of the interest in time since we started a little bit late, but um, Muthoni's discussion is actually an excellent segue into the next speaker, um, Ahuna uh, Ezio Kunwa of uh, UN OCHA, who's going to discuss a little bit about what the UN is doing um, in light of the humanitarian crisis. Thank you. I will try not to make a speech after our last two speakers who are Kenyans and are who, who I think have really captured the essence of what's going on in Kenya, including the humanitarian aspect. So I, I will just make a few comments. I want to say that I think one of the surprising things for me about the way the world has reacted to Kenya is the surprise that people showed about what was evolving in Kenya. Where did that come from? Whoa, you know, this is a dear, stable, peaceful, progressive country that, um, you know, should never have seen this kind of uh, ugliness um, affecting it. So that just goes to show um, how we interpret countries' uh, ev evolution and development. Obviously, Kenya is a beautiful country. I've been there many times. Many of you have been there. And uh, some of us go there on safaris. We see the beautiful hotels and beautiful places. But few of us go to the slum areas, for instance, in Nairobi, which is the capital. Last year, Ocha opened an office in Kenya. Uh, there we would only open offices in countries where we consider there to be a humanitarian situation. So obviously already some years ago, this country had a hidden humanitarian problem, uh, which people did not see. Uh, Mina, as I walked in, was talking about previous displacements of uh, the 1990s. Uh, your numbers were actually a bit more conservative that, than our estimates. It was about 500,000 IDPs in Kenya before this crisis. And uh, not many people saw that or spoke about it. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I understand that the residents of Nairobi, about 60% of people who live in Nairobi live in the slum areas. Um, 
that might be an overestimate, but it's a good chunk of people in urban centers who are living in conditions that Muthoni described. Extremely, extreme hardship, lack of protection, rape issues were there even before. Um, so this was not a very pretty picture even before uh, December 27th. Um, I just wanted to underline that. Secondly, I want to say that there have been regional, um, some regional impact to this. Uh, I don't know if it was spoken about before I came here, but that's another reason one needs to be concerned about what's evolving in Kenya. Uh, just to give you an example, Nairobi has been for a long time the logistics hub for a lot of the big UN operations in the region. And this is an unstable region. Now you've got Sudan, you've got Ethiopia, Eritrea, DRC, uh, Somalia. So, I mean, this city has, was really housing a lot of the teams. For instance, the entire UN Somali team is based in Nairobi. And it is a supply route for, uh, to keep many of those missions, big UN missions running. So that's suffered some disruption as a result of uh, this problem. You've got landlocked countries as neighbors to, uh, to Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, for instance, who really rely on Kenya for many of their essentials, including fuel. And the shortages of that has really led to skyrocketing price increases. Uh, you've got Kenya itself as a, as a host for refugees from about nine African countries, countries that are still not fully recovered from their own crises, uh, countries like Sudan, DRC, and, and the others. About 264,000 refugees live in Kenya. Um, so these are some of the, the aspects, the regional aspects that one should factor into the thinking. Uh, in terms of the impact, uh, I, don't, I don't need to go further into details on that. We, uh, we are concerned about the nature of displacement. It's not your classic kind of uh, displacement in a war situation, even though the scale has been, you can liken to a war situation. There's not been a war in this country, but the scale of displacement within a short period of time, you can liken to, say, Liberia or Sierra Leone. Uh, but it's a different context. And, but the fact that the, the ethnic element of, of the displacement in terms of forced displacement is uh, it's a comp it's making it complicated in terms of response. And that's something that we're looking at carefully. You have displacement sites where uh, you have all the groups. So how do you respond to this? And you have situations where busloads of, pe of people from one ethnic group arrive and expect some assistance from humanitarian agencies to relocate them to their ancestral homelands. And then we face a dilemma as an international community. Do we facilitate that? And if we do, who takes responsibility for them as they arrive on the other side? Their security, their well-being, assistance in those communities. To what extent can we be part of this process, which is, you know, it's not ethnic cleansing in a systematic way, but it is homogenizing communities and a disintegration of what you could, what one saw before as social cohesion or national cohesion. Uh, that is disintegrating and homogeneous communities are forming and we are in the middle of it. So do we facilitate that? If you don't, people are threatened in places where they lived before and they cannot go back there. Uh, so what do we do? So these are questions that we are, we are wrestling with within OCHA and within the, the, the larger humanitarian community. The other question is resettlement. Usually when displacement happens in, an, in a situation of armed conflict, you foresee an end to the conflict and then you design a plan for resettling communities, uh, those displaced populations wherever they came from. We cannot think like that in the Kenyan context because some of these people will simply not return to those areas. Uh, they do not want to return. In fact, some of them have told us they just simply want to go back to other places. So how long is this going to go on for? 
Do we make a resettlement plan? Do we plan to have them where they are currently? What do you deal w do with land issues? Who gives the new land? Land is another hmm. <laughs> separate issue that we can't even begin to touch here. But it is a real issue for Kenyan populations. Um, the other thing is the high mobility of the population. It's because of the ethnic nature, again, of the threat. You see people resisting being consolidated in larger camps, which is what we would do to ensure that services are well spread. If you have people concentrated, it's easier to serve them. But people rather split up. We have nearly 300 IDP sites today. So if you divide that among the population, there are very small groups in very many sites. And not all of them do we have access to. And we can say here, you know, maybe about 500,000 people have been reached with assistance. But we also know that there are a lot of people in remote areas in smaller centers who have not been accessed. Uh, the, 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 the other thing I would like to say is something about who is actually responding. And this is one thing that Ocha had to take the lead in um, at the beginning. It's trying to help the international community understand that the Kenyan context was different from your regular Darfur kind of context, where we all move in, everyone with goodwill, and we think we're bringing something new. This is not a failed state. There are huge political challenges, but the Kenya infrastructure administration still works. And we had the district, community, uh, local government level administration functioning. The health centers, to some extent at the beginning, of course, they lost a lot of staff and things got, uh, services got diminished. But we had the Kenya Red Cross at the forefront of the response. Uh, I have to be frank in, in tabling that. You had lots of Kenyans themselves, res, you know, Kenyan citizens, communities who stepped in to help their uh, fellow citizens who were um, suffering. So in fact, we were latecomers on the scene. You know, they were on the ground. The Kenyan Red Cross had 60,000 volunteers all over the country and they were really doing their best to help. The government did step in at some point and uh, from the Ocha side, we kicked in the humanitarian reform. Those of you who are students of humanitarian affairs may have studied the humanitarian reform agenda, which basically has three elements. The SURF, which is the Central Emergency Response Fund. Uh, we have the cluster approach, and then we had the strengthening of uh, humanitarian coordination on the ground. The SURF was deployed within the first two weeks at $7 million provided to agencies to, Im to address immediate needs. And this, again, was done in a supportive role to the Kenyans who were already working hard. And then uh, we, we established clusters, and this was a way to get the UN to work in harmony and to be coherent in their support to the to the population. And one of those clusters is the protection cluster, which didn't exist before. And that protection cluster, Mudoni, is looking into those issues that you mentioned, particularly regarding gender and the, and the, and the issues of sexual violence. And then we launched an appeal following uh, to support things on the, in the longer term. And the appeal was for $35 million. Uh, that appeal will be revised. <clears throat> once more assessment has been done. And what we see here, unfortunately, is a long haul. I mean, we're not about to you know, pack up and leave. People will need support for a long time. Livelihoods have been destroyed. It's not just the immediate needs. People have lost their jobs. People have lost their homes. So there is long term, we foresee long term support in the response. All the agencies are there on the ground, uh, UN agencies, the NGOs, uh, international NGOs, some of them have moved in, all the teams. Uh, it was a development team, the UN team on the ground initially, but they have flown in emergency uh, teams to assist. I mean, let me not take more time. I'll just conclude by saying I think what we see in Kenya today is really not 
um, specific to Kenya. It's not unique to Kenya. We, we see it in so many other countries, not just in Africa either, also in the rest of the world. But it's a wake-up call, and I think that it may not be entirely negative. It's a positive statement that people are now, particularly people in Africa, will no longer tolerate empty democracies that don't link that democratic process to their lives you know, to daily living, to the issues that they confront on a daily basis, socioeconomic development, that link between democracy and how people live on a day-to-day -day basis. It's about that, and I think that the Kenyans are making a very loud statement in a way that people don't perhaps appreciate because it's ugly and it's violent, but it's a wake-up call for the rest of us. Thanks. Well, Jackie, why don't I speak from here, and I'll try to be, uh, I'll try to be extremely brief. As I, I, I told Mina, I'm really here just to, to shut up quickly so that we can get on to the to, to discussion. And it's, for me, it's, it's a great pleasure being at the table here with him and with uh, Muthoni and, uh, and just to be able to, to share in some sense of, of solidarity and support for, uh, for those who have been involved in this struggle. And, and as Mina knows, I've, I've been a student of Kenyans from the beginning of my career in human rights and so much of what I think I understand about the, about the continent has come through my thinking together with Kenyans and, and in Kenya. And I would just want to, uh, to, to perhaps remind us of a, of a few points that, um, that, 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 that maybe we're aware of but are worth recalling. Uh, the specifics of Kenya. Sure, there's a lot that's going on there that is like what's happening in the rest of Africa, but there's also some aspects that should be remembered as, as, as particular and, uh, and, to, and to be held on to. Um, Kenya has had a civil society that has been particularly uh, dynamic and dis in distinction for, uh, to many of the other civil society movements in Africa has focused on issues of legal reform and institutional reform from very early on so that the stories that Mina's recounted of the struggle for a constitution, the focus on a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the institutional developments were something that civil society made a point of. It's rare to be in a country in Africa at any time where cab drivers will talk to you about the struggle for a new constitution. <laughs> it's certainly one experience that I've had in, in Kenya. The impact for the rest of Africa, well, in Africa, there's always those who are shopping for the best stories and for the worst stories. And with the improved communications and the access to information, there's no story that isn't known quickly throughout the continent. And as we look at the story of Kenya, it, it, it's, it, it could fall into line with those of, uh, of the tragedies of Zimbabwe, the tragedies of Cote d'Ivoire, of those countries that have struggled with democracy, struggled to achieve democracy, and have come up against the, 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 um, those who would, who would frustrate it and who would then rely on ethnic distinctions and ethnic battles in order to undermine it. And we've certainly seen that in other places in Africa. Each story, that uh, each hopeful tale feeds a, a, a thousand movements within the country and, uh, and, and each story of tragedy undermines an equal number. And those uh, around the continent are, are watching Kenya and seeing Kenya for something else that's fairly specific in Africa. This is not just one more story of a stolen election. It's the story of the fragility of democracy as it struggles into a second, into a third set of elections, a third generation within the continent. We were, I think, as one colleague recently told me in Dakar, simplistic in our thinking at the end of the Cold War. We thought you could get rid of dictatorship and democracy could triumph. It turns out that democracies are expensive. Democracies are unsettling. Democracies, when the structures are not in place, can unleash forces that the state is not ready to deal with. And then comes the challenge of whether to hold on and to build those institutions or to give in to the cynicism of both Africans, Americans, Europeans, who can very easily resort to an argument that was heard in the 1960s and is already being heard in Africa today and in Western capitals today the strongman argument. We need strong men because Africa is tribal and we need to hold the lid on these tribal passions. And those arguments I hear from across the continent and those arguments clearly are those that the ethnic entrepreneurs of Kenya today are helping to encourage even further. Mm. 
I would note the unsettling quality of the international press. Um, those who have read uh, the New York Times and Jeffrey Gettleman would never know that, in fact, the Africa, what Africa knew from the days after Kibaki came into power, which, which we've heard from Muthoni, the, that he disappointed, that he'd been disappointed in extreme ways. What happened to the planned Truth and Reconciliation Commission? What happened to John Gathongo of the uh, working on corruption issues inside the country? What happened to the constitutional compromise that had been discussed? Africans know that Kibaki very quickly put those to rest and that he began already to enforce a, a different uh, way of holding on to power. But he doesn't have the finesse that Moy had. He doesn't have the finesse of those who have been in power for long. And uh, what we saw in Kenya is, uh, is in many ways could be a, a, a hopeful tale of how elections were supposed to go right in every possible way and had to be stolen at the last moment in, in front of people's eyes in order to make them go, go wrong. So the, the hope is there, but the, uh, the risks are there as well. There's a story that, that hasn't been told in the, uh, in the international press, isn't being told uh, frequently enough, and, uh, and one that I think we, 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 need, to, um, we need to recall and, and to insist on. So as we're, as we're insisting on the, uh, the freezing of assets and we're insisting on the blame that needs to be attributed to those who are uh, responsible for this violence, uh, we should also be insisting on the uh, on better quality reporting and, and more voices from Kenya, like the voices that we have here tonight. Thanks. Well, I think we have a lot to reflect on. And speaking of voices from Kenya, it's a large diaspora. I can see uh, many of you are some of you are here today, and we're now going to open the floor up to you. I'm going to ask you to be brief. Um, and we'll take a number of questions, all right? So we'll open the floor now. Yes, sir. Can everybody hear me? I was in Kenya for the first two weeks uh, during the violence, and one of the most distressing things for me to watch was to see the extreme polarization on both sides and lack of understanding and then to watch uh, people like Maina Kiai speak on television, uh, effectively speak for a lot of Kenyans, uh, you know, talk about kinds of things that we wanted to hear about, uh, and yet sort of in the background feel at a loss because the people who are in a position to, to make a change were simply making inflammatory statements. And the people who are reasonable, who I think spoke for a large number of of reasonable Kenyans who are not in a position to, to make anything, to, to make a change. And you sort of touched on this with respect to a third force. How do we mobilize Kenyans around the world in a very, very specific way, right, to bring out the voice of this third voice, this third option, and, and in a very focused way, because there are a lot of disparate efforts that are taking place, but we sort of need to hear, perhaps, from Maina Kiai, can we sign on to the Kenya National Human Rights Commission something and have this just huge wave of Kenyans all over the world standing up for this third option? Thank you very much for that excellent, inspiring question. Exactly the kinds of questions we hope to hear tonight. Are there others who would like to speak now? Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> My name is Peter Burgess. I'm sorry I'm not a Kenyan. Um, I'm a colonial one. I have a couple of quick points. One is, of course, the, the, the point that was made in the, in the first presentation, that most of this started with a rather wrong independence performance. But um, moving now 44 years later, I am inspired by the number of people who are on the ground in Kenya, people like here, who are connected you know, on the internet. I'm part of a group that has been sending minutes to people in Kenya. And when the banks shut, and when the shops shut, and when everything shut, they had a tradable commodity to you know, get, get moving. They've also done a lot of uh, reaching out to 
everybody, their friends. Try not, not particularly important. And there's a lot of people wearing white shirts, which I understand is the white in the flag of Kenya is something to do with peace. Okay, the white shirts is all about peace. And if you look at the clips on the BBC, you'll see huge numbers of white shirts. And there's another group that does acrobatics. And they were formed originally to send HIV AIDS messages around places where literacy wasn't real high. And they are now doing what they call pyramids of peace, where the acrobatics is representing we, the people, want peace, we want progress, and it's all being linked um, electronically. And you know, to the extent that uh, anybody wants to join in, I'd love to be part of something in New York that every couple of weeks has a meeting like this to keep this thing moving. Because this is not something that we're going to solve tonight. Uh, we don't want to go on for an annual cycle, you know, every two weeks. So, you know, I'm, sorry, it's not a good question, is it? But, you know, no, it's, anybody has a no, thank you very much again for an important comment, and in fact, really very much in the spirit of what we're trying to do. And in fact, we've already started such a group, such a, a sort of effort here, and this is part of it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So thank you very much for those comments. There was a hand over here. Yes. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Oh, okay. So my name is Karimi Gituma. I actually traveled all the way on the Chinatown bus from Boston. I'm a medical student at Harvard Medical School. And I'm <laughs> graduating in June, so I'm very excited. Um, so what a, a group of students um, have done over there at Harvard and also extending to a lot of other um, young Kenyan professionals, we started an initiative actually just um, beginning of last month. We're calling it Uma Kenya, Rebuilding a New Kenya. It's kind of to address you know, the point that was raised up before, where we're trying to coordinate efforts within the US and hopefully eventually across to the UK as well, to coordinate and bring Kenyans together and also people who are concerned about the violence and what's happening towards having like um, non, uh, non-profit, non-partisan, um, peace-centered initiatives which are productive. Because of what I realized is that in a lot of the blogs and a lot of the media and what was being um, put out there is a lot of debates, but no one is actually doing anything. So especially for Kenyans who are stuck here in the U.S. who want to do something, who want to contribute, everybody is pretty much just wringing their hands and wondering what can we do. So we tried to develop this website, which is going to be a portal of information, listing all the different um, grassroots organizations, the Kenyan Red Cross, all different initiatives that are being carried out in Kenya as a way to just kind of guide people to see what's out there. So in about two weeks, um, this happened last Saturday, we had a huge benefit concert for the Kenyan Red Cross, which featured a lot of Kenyan artists. We had Eric Wainina was there, we had a lot of um, very popular and famous um, Kenyan artists performing in Boston, and we were able to bring together about 400 people. Um, and that was just something that we planned in two weeks. So that's something we, we're trying to get started as well, as well to you know, collaborate with other groups in other areas like in Minneapolis, Minnesota, coordinating all our efforts and you know, like helping us to rebuild the country. Because we as a Kenyan diaspora, we don't have you know, the ability to vote so in the way we are disenfranchised. But I feel that we have a lot of clout and a lot of resources. And if we all network together, then we can actually make a formidable you know, force that can actually change the direction of our country. So if you're able to link up with you know, esteemed guests, um, Maina Kiai and other esteemed leaders, that we can all you know, collaborate together. Um, we're hoping that we can also coordinate with them. Jackie, can I just turn this into a little bit of a question to Muthoni and to uh, sure. Maina? Because I've, I've been told that there's concern that some of the, the, about the negative role of the diaspora Kenyans and that that's been an issue. And I wonder whether there's a role to play among Kenyans to try and counter some of the, 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 the negatives that have come out. Maybe we'll take one more question by the lady in red and then uh, we'll have the panelists <laughs> briefly. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sharon Makuriwa and I'm a Kenyan. Um, we're all fully dressed, but um, this stands for love and not for blood. Excuse us, could you face the, the back so we can all hear? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, well, just face the back, that will okay. <laughs> okay. so, so, my question goes on to. Um, <laughs> 
my question goes out to Ahuna. Um, we appreciate the efforts that the international community is doing to assist Kenyans um, after the election crisis. And I must say I'm very proud of the Red Cross and other Kenyan groups and, and also Kenyan citizens who responded immediately that um, people recognized that this was a crisis beyond just um, vote tallying and, um, and um, selecting a president. Um, in that regard, um, I have a concern that as, you know, as the international community helps IDPs, that there may be a development of um, dependency and what efforts are being made um, to reestablish the lives of, you know, of IDPs so that we do not turn into a nation that is dependent on on, on donor agencies because you know previously the role of the UN agencies in Kenya have been established institutions working like any other institution and not established because you know they're responding to a crisis in Kenya um, so, that, so that's my question we we have an event organized but I'll leave that for later Time, that there's a lot of questions. So maybe if it's okay with the panelists, I'll take a few more since they've heard from us and then I'm gonna give you the last word. Um, all right, uh, the young lady here and then we'll go to the other side. Sorry. Uh, my name is Devin Brookins and I'm a student here at SEPA. And my question is kind of moving forward looking at the political transition. Um, basically, I'm interested in the role of regional organizations to, and international institutions to kind of help broker this idea of a transitional government. I mean, it's a, an idea that's already been tested and has maybe succeeded or failed in other countries such as Burundi and DRC. So what are the implications for this type of a, a shared agreement in Kenya? What does that mean? And if the, if um, maybe the discussion that Mathoni made about, you know, these are the same people playing uh, musical chairs, well, who's that third party? Is Who else would be participating in a transitional government that could present some real change to what the options are currently? Okay, we'll take a My name is Ifi Osaga, and I'm a student at Columbia Law School. Um, I'm sorry I came a little bit late and I missed um, Mr. Kiai's presentation. But I'm, and hopefully um, the question I'm going to ask has not yet been addressed. Um, well, no, well, okay, but I'll still ask the question. But um, I was just wondering, right now um, I'm from Kenya and I've been reading the news and you know, they talk about all oh, the peace talks um, with Kofi Annan are, you know, are headed to, I mean, we should be expecting great things um, from these talks. And I'm just wondering, to what extent do you think that these peace talks will be able to affect you know, the huge issues on the ground, like the huge inequalities, the land issues? You know, I'm, I just wonder if there will be a disconnect. Maybe the peace talks might solve the problems between you know, the, the political problems and not, and I'm wondering to what extent this will also you know, affect issues on the ground, real issues that actually are causing the current problems that we're having right now. me to go before you. Um, thank you very much, Mina, and the rest of the panel for your very good presentation. I also, sorry, my name is Jacqueline Oluoch. I'm from Kenya also. And my greatest concern as my colleague who's gone ahead of me also is the issue of economic policies that Kenya has. Mina, you mentioned in your talk that Kibaki came in, in, came in through a platform of getting rid of corruption and economic development. But what we saw was economic development that came along with great, great revenue collection from all sources from in Kenyan society. So what I'm asking is, what long-term policies can we put into place such that we can have social protection for Kenyans? You know, something like a welfare of sorts. Because when I did my studies in international development, I recognized that Kenya was one of the only few countries in Africa that does not have social policies except for HIV orphans. So I'm wondering where we can put that because if the people who are busy killing each other had jobs or some welfare check coming in through cash transfers, the violence wouldn't have proceeded as it did. Okay, we'll take a two more here and then we'll ask the lady. Right. 
My name is uh, Teddy Warrior. I was invited by Melchizedek Okudo to come here. This question is directed to Maina Kiai. Thanks for your good work. And uh, I know this is a question about uh, extreme uh, democracy, one man, one vote, versus extreme capitalism, one man and a couple of his funders as propping in a government in the case of one Mwai Kibaki. And uh, my question now is, uh, I happen to be an Anglican. My mother happens to have been a Catholic. My two brothers are married to Kikuyu women. So I happen to be a Luo. So my question is, what are you doing as a person uh, to direct the religious forces in Kenya, especially the Catholic Church, uh, which uh, Mr. Kibaki happens to be a member, and uh, the Anglican Church, which uh, it was strange uh, bedfellows, the state uh, liaising with the church in, a, in something, in a marriage that was not supposed to happen because I believe they were supposed to be the mediators in this case. So could you, in the spirit of Kenya, of Yote Awezekana, with the songs you have sung before, and Bogabul and all that, would you lead a youth effort to be this third way? Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this great panel. Um, I have a call to help embedded in my question. Um, and my question is inspired by Muthoni's comments and the title of your speech. I was in Kenya exactly a year ago for the World Social Forum and was collaborating with a community group called the Babadogo Youth, which is one of the slums in Nairobi where about 80,000 people live. Um, most of us talk about Kibera in the West, but 80,000 people is a pretty significant slum. Um, I myself work in a slum in New York. I see, teach in the South Bronx Global History. And so my question to you all is, um, what role do small community groups or um, dispersed members of a fractured community have um, in building peace? And particularly those of us in the West, um, what kind of support can we provide to these small community groups like the, Papado the Babadogo mm -hmm. self-help group, which is a bunch of young men from 18 to 25 without high school educations who have rallied together to do community cleanups and AIDS awareness but who now are facing this massive tidal wave. Um, and the call to help is if anyone has any opportunities to collaborate with me, I'm basically the sole representative of this community group in the West. So um, thank you very much. Great. Actually, that's part of, again, the reason for this. And we have a list of community groups that we're going to give out to people who are interested. We're going to talk to Karimi. We're going to hopefully create a bigger network. So that's the point. Awesome. So don't run away after Okay, the lady up here, and then I'm going to give the last, Thank you. last question. Um, I was at Uhuru and had great hope for Kenya and have still feel hopeful. But I was also the executive director of the African American Student Foundation, Tom and Boya's Airlift, mm -hmm. that brought 779 mm -hmm. students here for education. Mm -hmm. And I very much appreciated all of your comments but none of you mentioned education. And I wonder if you could talk just for a bit about schools, teachers, and whether a proposal that's being considered now from the University for Peace in Costa Rica and their sister school in Addis to put together an international team of peace educators to come in and help train educators formally and non-formally in conflict resolution, steps to reconciliation, but in an effort to try to quell some of the hatred and violence and introduce some methods for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Peter. I subscribe to the East Africa the Fellows List Serve, and uh, we have been exchanging views, exploring possibilities of finding a solution to the Kenyan problem. In the beginning, the tones of the exchange were very hot, but there is hope because we see from the tone of the emails that tempers are cooling and constructive solutions are being worked out. And I think that's a very positive thing. Um, the lady um, in the blue sweater raised an issue which I have been thinking about as well. 
um, from the emails we have been receiving and exchanging, I think um, let me touch on something rather sensitive. Although the efforts are going on to address the issues, but I think we should acknowledge that to me as I think, the violence that led, the, 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 the violence that erupted after the elections to me were like a, a button that was, that, that was provided to provide an opportunity for the violence to explode. The international community, I think, had a rather false view of peace in Kenya, I'm afraid. To me, the problem in Kenya was waiting to happen. Looked at it from a historical perspective, right from the time when Jomo Kenyatta took over, his experience with Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, come to the time and to the mysterious death of Tom Boyer, come to the death of Robert Uhuku, come to the death of Kariuki. These were people who represented a hope for change. The 60% of the people in the slums in Nairobi have been looking for alternatives, have been looking for opportunity, or have been looking to those who would come over and change the status quo to give them hope, not only in politics, but in the injustice in the economy. And to me, it was like, all the past frustrations were built up and there was hope that this time Raila would speak for them. And when the elections went its way, certainly what has been building up exploded. Um, well, I'm not just going to dwell in the past, but I think what she raised gives me a concern that unless we recognize that the bitterness has been deep-seated, the frustration has accumulated over years, and we develop the sensitivity and the patience to handle the situation, we are going to treat the symptoms and not the root causes. Kofi Annan will sit and talk as a diplomat, but to what extent is he going to touch on the very deep roots of the problems that people have hidden in their hearts over these years. If we can get to that, then we'll build a better society. Thank you. Let me, if you don't mind, I'll try and take them from here. And let me start off with the easier questions. Although they were quite difficult, I think, to a large extent, and I I think on the on the education, and I think just to start off with that, because I think that's something that that we have been affected, and I think that and somebody also touched about the sustainability of OCHA and international interventions. I think there's there's always a sense um, many times when there's a crisis across the world of the international community assisting, and I think it's it's generally welcome. <clears throat> but one of the things that's that Kenya is pretty good at is develop is, is its own capacity. It's got a large human capacity uh, in, in that country. And I think that even as we welcome and as we in, ask for international assistance, I think it's got to be targeted well and it's got to be time bound because we don't want to create an industry of, of, uh, of, uh, of dependence. And it's very easy for that to happen. And we have seen it with many groups so I am always very sensitive about, about that. And I think that whoever is coming in, whether it's the UN University for Peace, and there's a lot of, by the way, peace trainers and peace, trained peace people in Kenya who have been involved in the Sudan, in Somalia, in, in Rwanda, in DRC. There are many people. But I think we always need to put at the front of our heads about leaving that capacity in that country. And so whatever it is and the groups that are forming here, and I think I would encourage you to do so. But, but always do it th th thinking out how does this initiative help leave capacity for the future. Kenya cannot be turned into, we must not turn Kenya, I mean, we have come so far. We must not turn Kenya into a small uh, free town uh, in Sierra Leone, which was 
packed with all this UN people and so little capacity outside there. That actually hurts. And I and I'm very conscious of that. Sometimes international goodwill channeled badly hurts more than it helps. So keep the goodwill and channel it well. And and I think there's so many ways of doing that. But building the capacity and increasing the capacity of Kenyans has got to be the f at the front of everybody's a a approach, even, even what OCHA and the rest of the UN is doing. And to that extent, I think Kenya Red Cross has really proven itself among other local groups. And, and I think when we think about even some of the original work and original um, points that were raising funds and raising support, you find uh, it was Caroline Mutoko of KISS FM, you know, a uh, journalist who just woke up and said, look, I'm fed up of all this. This is what you can do. And she's a genuine Kenyan hero. Nobody has ever trained Caroline Mutoko in humanitarian work and humanitarian reform, you know, but she understood it sufficiently to say, let's do what I can do. There's a lot of talent in Kenya. So whatever else we do, whatever we do, let's keep that in the top of our heads. The, uh, the, just a little bit on, on, the, on the coffee and iron process. We have a, it's divided into two. One is the short-term approach first, which is how do we get a grip on these things, and then the longer term that is supposed to last a minimum of a year. And whether it's he himself or somebody else, in fact, when they were inviting Cyril Ramaphosa, the idea that Cyril Ramaphosa would run the, the longer term process until its very end. So that it's, it's meant to look at those broad, deep cleavages, issues of land, the issues, in fact, of the displaced, as, as, as I think Ocha was saying. We have got you know, easily 500,000 total internally displaced. Where are they going to go? There's no land in central Kenya. Ex unless you take Uhuru Kenyatta's la farm, Mwaiki Baki's farm. <laughs> Maybe there is a bit of land if you start thinking like that. But, but beyond that, there really is no land in central Kenya. You cannot sustain that. And so we have to find an answer. Um, and this problem, by the way, is, is maybe being seen now for Kikuyus. But the Kisi have a problem too. They have filled up Kisi. They've now moved on in Transmara among the Maasai. The Maragoli are dying for land. It's not just one community. And so there's got to be some thinking done about how to deal with landlessness, how to deal with the squatters as well, and how to deal with us moving away from the culture of agricultural land for social security, because that's what it was for many people, and, and maybe moving away into more urbanization and more industry and more getting people away from land. I mean, look, Kenya is three times the size of Great Britain. Great Britain has got twice the population of Kenya. It's 65, 60, 60 million, 65. They feed themselves, they don't all farm, and the weather isn't as great as ours, but they feed themselves. So we have to be able to find a way to feed ourselves but also be able to take people out of the land and into other production, which is where education plays a great role. And you know, I kind of feel, I kind of, I personally feel, you know, gr great now that secondary education for free has finally started in Kenya. But this should have happened, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But corruption and other those those endemic issues should have happened long time. So we are still, we are now trying to catch up. And and I I always feel worried that we don't think long term and we think short term. We we have, you know, in fact, in terms of even land, we only have 1.7% forest cover in Kenya, which is inadequate by UN standards. We have to jump that to at least 10%, which means we have to plant farmland with trees. Otherwise, our environment is going to keep on getting hurt, and we can't sustain ourselves with a bad environment. So we are going back and forth on these things, and we have to get away from, our, from, from the way we farm. We have to get away. We've got to think creatively and think, and, and I have always said when we talk about squatters is that even if you give every squatter three acres of land, they each, then they have six kids or four kids, they divide that, it gets finished. So we, only, we can only solve landlessness for one generation. So what happens to the next generation? So you've got to stop this short-sighted approach and think long-term and think how are we going to deal with that. Um, the, on, on the th you know, third option, the, before I go to that, op the grassroots groups, I think Jackie is leading, uh, leading some good views. I think we're all, we all struggling to figure out how we can contribute. And I see that my friend uh, Elchi Navroji is back here and he's one of the, 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 the patriots of Kenya. So I also urge you to, to, uh, to link up with him. He he's, he's comes from a, a, a strong line of Kenyans, Kenyan patriots. And there are few people as touched as the, uh, the Navroji family. 
I said that to your father and to your sisters. Let me say it now in public so you can hear it. Uh, they are wonderful people, the Navrojis. There are few Kenyan families as patriotic as that family. And, and they're doing something out here as well. So linking up with people, I think, is, is important. The negative role of the diaspora. I mean, I, I, I get some of the emails and the dirty talk from the diaspora. I mean, the first part, the first challenge for us here, you are part of the diaspora. Start disciplining yourselves. You have to change that language. I have never seen such horrible things as said by the diaspora. And these things get back and they become part of our normal vocabulary and normal expressions in Kenya. The diaspora is, is, is privileged. You're very privileged people to be living here and living wherever you are and out of Kenya. We've got to see much more responsibility, a lot more. I think the diaspora, so as we're thinking about positive things, we also need to start sanctioning ourselves in the diaspora. It's just un unacceptable unacceptable, the kind of, of divisions that have happened even in the diaspora. And maybe it's part of the process. Maybe we'll come back together. But I tell you, I, I, I shudder whenever I open up emails from the diaspora. I just, I know today will be another abuse. And there's all these all this blog sites that are nasty. Real nasty. You know? And so we've got to start using this skills we've gotten, these opportunities we have to pos in a positive manner. And it's something that is a challenge to you. I leave it with yourselves because, you know, this is America. You can't be policed. You can say anything you want. But at least help us. Don't, don't, don't hurt us because you're very influential. The money you guys have given Mwai Kibaki and Raila Odinga has been part of the campaign. And all of you guys gave money. All of you Kenyans, I know you did. <laughs> because they kept coming here to raise money from you over and over and over again. So you're part of the problem. It's time for you to be part of the solution. Uh, on the Catholic Church, Anglican Church, I mean this... Uh, like everybody else, the church is divided. Eh? I, 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 am, I am having, I'm having lots of discussions with some of the leadership of the churches trying to see if they can move forward. But everybody is riven with their, with their issues. And, and it's hard sometimes, you know, you, you talk to some of the bishops um, and, and what you hear them say is, 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 is scary and so very, very political. Um, so it's as really the process of us, all of us, and maybe again, you can where you can help is help us move towards the middle and forget these extremes. It's it's it's, it's got to have to happen. And I think all whatever whatever all of us can do, the more you write in the media, the more you write in the blogs and other places, the better. And just working with people to see that it's not a, it's not a winner take all situation has to happen. That's where the problem lies. But we have grown up, all of us in a society that believes in winner take all. And some of the comments that are made, I, I, I heard um, Amos Kemunya on television, the Minister of Finance saying that, you know, uh, w that, that we have to keep a system. It's like asking the winner of the New York City Marathon who wins to share his earnings with, with a person who comes second. So it's impossible. And then I wish I, was, I wish I could have responded to say, well, you tied your opponent's legs first of all, you bribed the referee and made sure you were the winner. So you can't talk about this in that form. But it's just that nastiness that's, I won, therefore I must take it all. And we just have to move away from that in Kenya. And, and I think we've got the chance. I think it's a great moment for us. Um, finally, for me, just then I, 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 will, I will move, I'll move away, is, is, the, uh, and is that the third force will happen. It will happen. A third group will happen. I think today, though, just our own reality checks is that you really can't, within the present tension, you can't have an interim government without these two men. They represent a lot. They represent a lot. For the Kikuyu, Kibaki represents control of some of the state machinery. You can't put another Kikuyu instead of him because you won't have control. For the other communities, Raila represents aspirations and hopes. They have to be there for the short term. And I think it's, it's a painful realization to make, but it's a truth. And I think that this is what is there. Um, and I think, you know, again, people voted for these two guys. And, you know, democracy is like that. Sometimes you choose George Bush, sometimes you choose other people. Uh, and if you're smart, you'll choose Barack Obama. Let me say that first. <laughs> if you're smart, you know. But that's what democracy is. So we make our choices. And, and you know, I think that it will emerge. I think it's coming. But it's going to be a painful process. And I think the space for that is hopefully will emerge from these talks and this process we're going through. That space for a different grouping to, to emerge will happen. 
and let me just say that you know I'm not a politician. One of the one of the things that I I am able to say these things because I I don't I'm not vying for votes, eh? so I can say whatever I want to say. You can like it or you can hate it. You know, I'll move on. You know, that's why and I like that role. I I really would like to keep it going. Musoni, <laughs> you say. Um, just to add, um, I think there is need for us to coordinate the activities um, that are taking place and um, it, is, it is encouraging to hear what you guys are doing and, you know, like what Karemi has explained. Um, I am part of the Cornell student body and the larger Ithaca Kenyan community that is also um, organizing a Heal Kenya campaign. And so, you know, if we shared all this, I think there would be good efforts. One of the things uh, um, that we need also to, to realize is what uh, Ahuna? Ahuna said, that the situation in Kenya about the IDPs is, is a bit different from other places because you know, just like it is ethnically based, you find that some people find their way to so-called relatives. But uh, where they are going, they don't have a home, they don't have, you know, they, they need help. And so as much as Red Cross and the international community, uh, you know, the international organizations have come in and helped, and they are targeting the, the camps, you know, the big camps, I think there is, it's also important for us especially as Kenyans in the diaspora, to focus on those other small initiatives in the, in the communities. People are dying of hunger. We were just uh, exchanging emails with uh, Jackie about a community in Ugunja, uh, a community organization in Ugunja. They are doing good work, but they need your help because they are not as visible as Red Cross. So. It, you know, we, we need to coordinate our efforts, but we also need to know that Red Cross is not realizing, it's not reaching everybody. We need also to remember that. Um, again, to add to what Maina says, I think the role of the Kenyans and Africans and people in the diaspora, I think change starts with you. Change starts with you, really. If you are so conv convinced that uh, because I'm a Kikuyu, I must be in power, or because I'm a Kikuyu, um, you know, we are right, then that's where the problem starts. And the kind of emails that I've seen us exchanging, really, they are terrifying. You know, I, I didn't know I'm guilty of being a Kikuyu because. I didn't choose to be a Kikuyu. I didn't choose. Nobody of us applied to be either this or the other. And, you know, I, I've been trying to argue that there are other angles to look into this crisis. For example, the inequality that we are blaming whole communities saying they benefited, now it is our time. Or they have taken all the, you know, good lands, and that is... You know, when you say that, you are justifying the killings. Unfortunately, you're justifying the killings. And, um, you know, I don't know um, why I should be guilty because Kenyatta was a tribalist and Kibaki is a tribalist and they have been in power. Um, I'm not guilty. They have not been in power because they have, they have they are there as Kikuyu presidents. They have been national uh, leaders and they should be held accountable for what they do. You know, they should be held accountable for what they do. I think we need to put the class angle into this because if we don't, we're going to continue recycling these people, laying our hopes on people who really don't care about us. Mm. To be frank, ODM are not the Jesus as we were waiting for. They are not. And I just gave an example of how they frustrated. Raila Odinga, somebody I slept in Freedom Corner fighting for his release from detention, frustrated our efforts to change the constitution. You know? They still want to enjoy power the way it is before it changes. 
All of them. They want to enjoy power the way it is. And the Luos in Kibera, the Luos in Nyanza, just like their counterpart, Kikuyus, will continue walking to industrial area, area to look for a job for 70 shillings a day, even if Raila goes to State House. There is a class angle to this, and we have to apply it when we are looking at it. If I had my way, all that group should not be in power and should never, ever be near power. <laughs> all of them. Kibaki should not have even have attempted a second, leave alone the fact that I didn't even believe he's capable of leading that country in 2002. So I think we need to apply other, other measures when we are defining the crisis in which we are going through. It is historical also. And it doesn't start in 1963. It starts with colonialism. You know, the way the British demarcated that country into ethnic enclaves, you know, the divide and rule policy is what is hurting us now, which Kenyatta took over, he perfected, you know, and Moi took over for 24 years, he perfected even further, and of course, I didn't expect Kibaki to change uh, within five years. What political metamorphosis? 2002, we were told Kibaki, you know, is the reformist that we needed after Moi. What political metamorphosis has Kibaki undergone since 1992 when he was saying trying to bring back multipartism in Kenya is like attempting to cut down a fig tree with a razor blade? What, what, what did we expect from this kind of person? So I, what I'm trying to say is we have to change the way we are analyzing our situation. And that's why sometimes I feel disappointed with my own middle class people, you know, we the elite who have the power of the pen, because we are not giving all the angles to the analysis. And so we have left the field for that top class and the hooligans they are able to mobilize. The people who are really, I shouldn't call them hooligans, but they have become gullible because they are frustrated. The inequalities are just too much. They don't have jobs, they don't have a livelihood, so when they are offered 100 shillings, they can go and kill their neighbors. Evidence is coming out how this, you know, uh, violence was premeditated and who was being paid how much to kill this person, who was being paid how much to burn a, a house, you know, and those are the same people who are waiting in the wings to go to state house, right? So we need to also look at that and start changing the way we look at ourselves and probably that is where the third force is going to develop from. And to that, I add, to what extent do the talks, are the talks going to address those issues? Um, to some small extent, if you ask me. Just because the, the, the negotiating uh, team, the, the Kofi Annan team, has brought out these issues and said, we are not just talking about a stolen election. We must talk about the violence, we must talk about uh, these inequalities, we must address ourselves to this, some of these things. But it's not gonna happen within this span that they are negotiating. So it is only to a small extent. The biggest job is with us, Kenyans. How do we want to define our country? Do we want to divide it according to the communities? Fine, let's do that. But let it be our decision. Or do we want to look at ourselves as Kenyans and agree that there have been inequalities and define those inequalities and fight for a just and good governance as opposed to whether it is a Kikuyu in state house or a Luo in state house, a just and good governance. And Maina is saying it as a joke. I wish I could get support. Personally, I would actually go and mobilize those Kikuyus who are camping in, uh, you know, those camps that they have been taken to, and they go and occupy Uhuru Kenyatta's land. Yeah. <laughs> one of the people who funded heavily, I'm sure all of us funded this or the other, but one of the people who funded heavily the ODM elections, the campaigns, was Akikuyu. These things have to come out. 
Jonjo is a Kikuyu, but he funded ODM. Now people are being beaten the other side, and they are being dropped at uh, showgrounds, you know? And Jonjo owns half the Kabete constituency. Why are they not being taken there? You know, we have to deal with these things. We have to tell these people we are tired of living in abject poverty while the means of production that, you know, we need to develop our country are being uh, in the hands of a few of us. And we need to face them. And we need to tell them that. And for that, many, many Kenyans won't care who sleeps in state house, what kind of community he or she comes from. They won't care. The reason why all this is happening is that economic deprivation. And if you did a tally of the top people who own wealth in that country, you will find almost a representation across board communities, right? Just like if you did a tally of the lower rank, the people in the slums, you know? Somebody asked, you know, in those emails, if you did a tally of the rich people, where would they come from? Where would the majority be coming from? Meaning, Kikuyus. I said, yes. Just like if you did a tally in Kibera or in the slums, in the streets, in the prisons, you know, the hawkers, the majority of the hawkers are Kikuyus, the majority of the peasant farmers are Kikuyus. So what's the issue here? Do we want to just look at ourselves as this or the other and encourage a poor Kikuyu uh, neighbor to kill a poor Luo neighbor? Or we want to encourage them to look at their plight as Kenyans together and face those who are running the country down? That is the task of we who are, uh, who are doing reading here. That is our task. What economic policies do we need? If I was asked, this constitution review we want to do, I think we need to tell that political class to stay aside. We have able people, the minors and the others, we have able people who can sit in a constitutional conference and do a constitution for that country. But so long as it is done within the political contestation that we are doing right now, believe you me, they won't talk about those inequalities that we are talking about. The reason why they are killing to get to, to, get to state house or to remain in power is so that they can defend themselves against anyone who may want to come and get that wealth from them or follow them for the atrocities they have caused in the country. That is why they won't let go of power. So, you know, those, those are some of the things that, even if they shake hands, those are some of the things that we should go back to the streets and fight for. A constitutional conference that addresses this, the policies that are running the country. I think I need to stop there. Take some time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, I want to just quickly yeah, comment sure. on two points. Um, the point on education is actually very important. Um, you know, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs was just in Kenya, and this is one of the issues that uh, he was uh, uh, addressing. We have in one location 65,000 children, primary school level, who are out of school. They're displaced, so they are not in their regular school environment. And almost 9,000 children in that location, I think it's the North Rift Valley, who are also displaced. The concern here is the more children stay out of school, the more you see them being uh, involved in the violence. Mm. And we've already seen some of that happening, where children mm. are falling victims mm. to this kind of recruitment into the forces. So they need that structure to be protected from, from, from being part of this. And whatever we can do to increase uh, that opportunity, even for the displaced, I think it's what we need to look at. For the question, uh, my friend over here, she's left now? Oh, oh there she is. Um, on dependency, I think Miner's point, I would su support those uh, uh, strategies of also building the capacity of, of, of local institutions. But whether Kenyans are supported by Kenyans or by internationals, dependency is dependency. And I think that at the end of the day, it's really about offering alternatives. I don't see any reasonable human being who would prefer to go sleep in an IDP camp if they have a home to go to. 
So uh, the longer term issues, the root cause issues, all of this need to be solved. We need to assist people if they're needy. If you've got people who are starving as humanitarians, we simply cannot ignore that on the basis of a principle of people being independent. And the fact is you have a Kenya today where there are people who cannot survive without humanitarian assistance. Thank you. Peter, did you want to? Okay. Actually, uh, and uh, I'd just add the voice of Agre Omande, who's busy working with internally displaced as far off as CIA. Um, and he said to me over the phone just a few days ago, you know, those Kenyans abroad raised a lot of money, like Maino saying, for campaigns. If only they would mobilize to help us now. And so I hope we'll keep that in mind. Um, but it's really my pleasure to thank the panelists. I think you've done a, an amazing job with this discussion. We also have a, a little gift for them before they leave, uh, a token of our appreciation. But there are a few people I really want to thank. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Mamadou Diouf, the head of the Institute of African Studies, which has really supported this event. Thank you very much, and all your staff. Uh, special people who have really made this possible. They represent, I think, uh, a young, dynamic group of Africans who are going to make a difference. I'd like to, to thank uh, Diana Ojunga um, here, who really tracked Maina down, made this possible. Sachin Gathani back there, critical. And also Harriet Williams from Sierra Leone. Is she here? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, one more thing, before you leave, we really have, we really do want to use this uh, as an opportunity to network and to join forces and help support that third force and support the humanitarian efforts. Uh, we have an event uh, that's gonna happen at NYU. Sh Sharon, you wanna talk about that? And also again, pick up the, f the, the um, sheet of all the different kinds of groups and their contacts of people on the ground. These are Kenyans heroically working to reverse what has just happened uh, as best they can. Uh, so you can directly contact them by email, sometimes by phone, and help them cope with the situation. Okay, Sharon, you want to say a quick word? Um, as you know, as we've all recognized, we were all very shocked as Kenyans by what happened to our country. And um, after hearing Mina speak, uh, Mina, was it two weeks ago that you were in um, at the New York Bar Association? A group of friends um, from NYU, current students, and also alum from NYU, are organizing a panel session that will be held on the 20th of February. The panel is supposed to give a very personal perspective on um, the experience of what Kenyans have felt during this whole period. So the panelists this time will actually be a group of students, Kenyan students, um, and it will be held um, at NYU at the Kimmel Center. Hopefully we can get um, into your contact listserv and, and disseminate information that way. Um, most importantly, as uh, Mudoni also said, obviously the greatest victims during such crises are women and children. And as Mudoni says, there have been very, um, reports about rape and lack of safety even within camps. So um, following the talk, one of the other events that we are organizing is a fundraiser for two reasons. One, this will be a club event. We recognize that there's a lot of animosity, enmity, and hate within the diaspora following what has happened. And um, this event is supposed to bring Kenyans from all ethnic communities together to begin to heal, you know, to begin to create a healing process. Um, and it will be on the 23rd of February. It will be at La Vagina, a club on 6th Street and Avenue C. It's an African-owned club. It's free event, but a suggested donation of $10, which will go to Urgent Action Fund that has been helping women who have been raped and living in the slums to get prophylaxis so that they do not contract HIV. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and if you didn't get all those details, make sure you put your email on our email list and Sharon will forward us the information. We'll be sending out uh, emails about these kinds of events. And finally, thank you to the audience. You've been patient. You've had wonderful questions. <laughs>